Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyid al-Mursaleen Nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Tonight inshallah we will begin readings from Umdatul Ahkam by Abdul Ghani al-Maqdisi Abdul Ghani al-Maqdisi Abdul Ghani al-Maqdisi was a, a scholar in the 6th century if I can remember correctly uh, and he was well known comes from a family of well known scholars and they come from the Quds area that's why they get the name Al-Maqdisi uh, in this book in the introduction of this book he basically states that some of the people uh, or his students asked him to compile a book which has hadith from Bukhari and Muslim <coughs> on the various abwab or the various chapters of fiqh. So it's not it's not a book which deals with manners, so to speak, or tafsir and things like that. It's just rulings on various things uh, on al-Islam. Uh, so it's no surprise that he has something about the third pillar of Islam, which is Som, or the fourth pillar of Islam, which is Som. And inshallah, we will take some readings from the explanation given by Sheikh Saad Ibn Nasr Shithri. Uh, Abdul Ghani al Maqdisi starts with Kitab al Siyam, naming the chapter with Kitab al Siyam. Kitab means chapter or book. Better to say book, I think. Uh, al Siyam. Al Siyam basically means imsak, which basically is to refrain or to withhold or to uh, re- refrain from something. Uh, this word comes in the Quran where Allah says in Surah Maryam about Maryam alayhi salam. Uh, basically when she was given the favor of Isa uh, given to her born without a father uh, Allah told her to refrain from speaking and this was a hikmah because Isa himself ended up speaking in the cradle which saved her or removed from from any kind of uh, accusation that the people could um, blame her of and it was a miracle and a sign that he was a messenger of Allah but the point here is that imsak imsak has been used uh, soma soma basically means imsak to refrain um, from this some of the scholars have stated that soma was prescribed for the woman before us just like it is prescribed for our ummah and another deal is found in surah baqarah Allah says, "Kutiba alaykum siyam, kama kutiba al-ladina min kablikum." Islam siyam is obligated upon you, just like it was obligatory for those people before you. Others from the scholars have taken a bit further and said that it is permissible, and it's quite clear in the eye of Surah Maryam that it is permissible for the previous ummas of fasting. The fasting that they had was obviously was different to ours. Uh, the reason being is that they were allowed to not talk uh, and this was a form of siyam for them. However, our siyam uh, is slightly different. <coughs> this leads to the next point. What is siyam in our sharia? Uh, this is very important because defining what things are gives us an understanding of what Allah wants from us and what the sharia uh, what the objective of the Sharia is. It also helps us understand the khilaf between the scholars. So something you might hear from the scholars, you might think it's strange, or it's a bit weird, or it goes against certain hadith, but by definition, it may not do. Uh, And the definitions of the Sharia, and when it comes to fiqh in particular, uh, the scholars are generally uh, on the same wavelength. So the point here is that the definition will help you understand what is part of Siam and what is not part of Siam. So some of the scholars have defined uh, Siam as being withholding from food and drink and intercourse during the day of Ramadan for people or for specific people, specific people meaning those people who are obligated to fast, not like the traveler or the woman on the men's only fast or the person who may be insane or the child. Uh, it doesn't apply to them. Food and drink and intercourse during the day of Ramadan. So it doesn't in- include... Uh, for example, how some people withhold 10 minutes before Fajr or they delay the suhoor, or the futur, like the Shia and the Jews do. Uh, Maghrib go, comes in, the sun goes down and they wait for 5-10 minutes before they can eat. Uh, this is all contradictory to the Sharia because Sharia says from dawn until dusk. So as soon as the sun 
begins to come up, as soon as the horizontal white line appears, that's when the psalm begins. And when the sun goes down and the and the and the sphere of the sun has disappeared from the horizon, that's when psalm is broken. Uh, so this helps us understand what psalm is. Now, uh, an everyday uh, example of this and how we can un- uh, understand the devil, we'll put the definition into an, our understanding. Many people seem to ask, you know, what is psalm and can we brush our teeth with toothpaste? Can we wear makeup? Can we have a shower? Can we go swimming? These kind of things. I mean, if we look at the definition that we've just taken, all of these things are permitted. As long as obviously it doesn't nourish your body and you're not putting it down your throat as you would do with food or drink. Uh, So these kind of things come to our understanding because of the definition. Kitab al-Siyam, Kitab al-Siyam is referring to Ramadan. Ramadan is a blessed month, it's the month that the Qur'an was revealed, it's a month that on one night, just one night, if you think about one night, I mean in England, in the summer, a night may be only about four or five hours, but those four or five hours are equivalent to 83 years of worship. Allahu Akbar, 83 years of worship. Our lives are deficient and our ibadah is deficient, but because of this one night and the flavor of Allah upon us, <coughs> This Ramadan uh, that he has given to us is something very, very blessed and something that we need to value and cherish and act upon uh, and hold and preserve. Uh, it is the, the time when the doors of Jannah is open and the time of Tawbah is open. Allah frees people from the, night, from the fire every night. Uh, and it is also some of the wisdom given by the scholars is that it is a time where a person becomes close to Allah. Fasting, a person who is fasting is not fasting because he is showing off. It is something that is between him and Allah. And an indication of this is found in the hadith as well where uh, Allah says, uh, Fasting is for me and I will reward it. As in, the, it's a blank check. He's not described how he will reward it. The other thing is, is that the Prophet wasallam said that the mu'min has two times in his life where he is happy. The time when he breaks his fast and time when he uh, meets his Lord. So the point here, or the, the, the evidence found in this hadith, is that the person who is fasting, who holds on to his fasting, the fourth pillar of Islam, uh, and tries to uh, do his best uh, in doing what the, the objective of Allah is upon him, basically connects him directly to Allah. Connects him directly to Allah and Yawm Al-Qiyamah, he will meet Allah. Uh, with happiness. It is also a month where the shaitan is subdued. Not only is he chained up, but some of the scholars say that the the shaitan runs through the the blood of Bani Adam just like uh, the blood runs through their bodies. And this is exactly the wording of the Prophet uh, who he said uh, the, the, the shaitan runs through the blood of Bani uh, Adam. It runs through the bodies of Bani Adam just like their blood. Now, when we are fasting, our veins become constrained, our stomachs become smaller. This basically restricts the flow of shaitan within the body of the fasting person. So there are certain wisdoms that the scholars have placed down. Uh, Kitab al-Siyam, and in this hadith, the first hadith of Kitab al-Siyam, an Abi Huray, radiallahu anhu, qal, qal Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, la tuqaddimu Ramadan bi sawmin yawm. Oh, you mean illa rajlun kani asum sawman fal yasum? Basically, the meaning here, or the translation, would be: Do not fast, uh, or do not precede Ramadan by fasting a day or two days before it, except for the person who habitually fasts. If he does, if there is a person who does that, then fast. Uh, firstly, in this hadith, the first thing that strikes us is that. Uh, we are not free to worship Allah how we want to worship Him. We need to ask and we need to inquire. Uh, certain times where fasting is not permitted, uh, just like on Eid day, just like on Jum'ah, uh, where the scholars have said that fasting on these days is not permitted. On the days of Tashriq, uh, fasting is not permitted. Uh, so basically, here, just like, just like Salah, we're not allowed to salah, pray Salah all day and neglect our, our families and neglect uh, earning a living. Uh, there are certain times where worship would not be allowed. It may be makru, it may be haram. So the first thing here is that we need to worship Allah in the way that uh, is uh, objected to us. 
uh, and understanding it from the way of the Prophet Sallam and the Salaf that came before us. Uh, also, the other thing is, is that after Sha'ban, mid Sha'ban, the scholars differed. Is it permissible for you to fast or not? Uh, they said when it comes to obligatory fast, everyone agrees that you have to fast obligatory fast. If you have to make an obligatory fast, or if you have to give a fast to or if you swore that you would fast on a particular day, these are kind of fasts that are wajib upon you, and you need to fulfill these fasts. But what we're talking about is a recommended fast. Now, on people that people fast on the fifteenth of Shaaban. Uh, is that something that is okay? Not only is it an innovation, but the Prophet ﷺ uh, told us not to fast that once half of Shaban or mid Shaban has uh, has come in, uh, and this is a hadith which is Hassan. Uh, so the majority of the scholars have stated here with this hadith here, do not fast uh, Ramadan. No, do not proceed Ramadan by fasting a day or two before it. <coughs> have stated that it is not permitted. To fast it is not permitted to fast uh, these days because the Prophet ﷺ is inciting the believers to be ready for Ramadan and do that they don't burn out, that they don't be meet Ramadan or precede Ramadan by fasting with high enthusiasm and then you know getting lazy or getting tired throughout Ramadan. So this is some of the hikmah that the scholars have stated uh, about this. But the issue here is: is it permitted to fast uh, during these days? You know, mid Ramadan, a couple of days before. Uh, Ramadan. Some of the scholars said it's haram, and some of the scholars said it is makruh. For Sheikh Saad bin Nasr al Shithri here is saying what is apparent from this particular hadith that it is not permitted. It is not permitted because the Prophet ﷺ outright prohibited it. And the origin in the Prophet ﷺ prohibiting something is that it is haram. Uh, some of the Hanafi said it is permitted, and Imam al Tahawi basically stated here is that we have a contradiction two days or half a month. Which one do we follow? The Prophet ﷺ in one hadith says, after half of Shaban, and the other hadith says, two days before the end of Shaban, right? and before two days before Ramadan. So he's basically saying here is that the 15 days or the half of Shaban is abrogated and we act upon this one. But the scholars have said that no, we can combine, we don't need to abrogate it. We can say that both are binding still, not abrogated. Uh, and it basically means that um, the person, except for the person who habitually fasts, we are not permitted to fast. And this is the view of many from this, the people of knowledge. Uh, the second point that the Sheikh mentions here is that the person who habitually fasts, you know, like Mondays and, and Thursdays or three days a month, for example, this person is permitted to fast uh, because he habitually does so. The third point that the Sheikh mentions here is that the Prophet ﷺ, after mentioning the prohibition of fasting a day or two days before Ramadan, makes an exception and says, except for the person who habitually fasts. The person who habitually fasts, then fasts. So there is a command. The Sheikh says that the, the, the origin of commands is that it is wajib for you to fulfill it. So basically, if the Prophet or Allah or any kind of text that comes in the Sharia tells us to do something, then in origin it is wajib and you cannot question it. If Allah says praise Allah, we don't say, well, is that wajib or is it sunnah is it nafil? No, it is wajib. The origin of each command or each prohibition is that it is wajib or it is haram. However, can we now say that the Prophet ﷺ has commanded this person to continue fasting? Does that now become wajib? Uh, the scholars have basically stated here is that it is not wajib. And the reason for that is because in essence or in origin, it wasn't wajib. So for example, if somebody is fasting Mondays and Thursdays, it's not wajib for him to do so. He's doing something that is recommended. But here, what the Prophet ﷺ is highlighting is an exception for this person. Uh, uh, and the command to fast here is that he may continue. He may continue. Uh, and the last thing here in this uh, hadith is what is known as Yom Shak, as in the day of doubt. Now, this day or this terminology has been used uh, in re- reference to this day throughout the books of fiqh. So, anybody who's fasting, anybody who's studying fasting, uh, will be familiar with this or they should get to grips with this because there are many ahkam related to the day of doubt, uh, day of doubt yeah. uh, such as moon sighting and such as uh, fasting in this instance and such as making up fasts such as uh, other things that the scholars have mentioned about the day 
of Shuk. Um, what is the day of Shuk? It's basically the last day of Shaban. Is Ramadan going to start on the 29th? Or is, it, as in, is Shaban going to end after 29? Or is it going to end after 30? What is prohibited here is for a person to fast these days. What could possibly be Ramadan uh, or the beginning of Ramadan is prohibited for us to fast yeah. in anticipation for Ramadan to start in certainty. So once we know Ramadan has has begun, that's when we begin uh, to fast and anything before that is prohibited uh, in this hadith. This is what we have in the first hadith of Kitab Siyam from Umdatul Hakam. I pray to Allah that He gives us the best of understanding and that that this has been beneficial for us and the listeners. Hadha wallahu a'lam. Sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajmain.